Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Valentin, do we hear me properly? Excellent, so I can start. Uh, in those times of uncertainty, I'm sincerely honored to moderate the panel named Israel Response to the Pandemic organized by Sachs Conference, which I'm grateful to for inviting me. Uh, my name is Dr. Laurent Schopp. I'm heading the life science activity in Kuckerman Investment House. I'm a doctor in veterinary medicine by training and leading this activity for the last 12 years between Israel, uh, Tel Aviv, and Lausanne, Switzerland. And uh, we are specialized in life science startups, raising capital, finding uh, partnership, and uh, selling their technology to, to larger corporations. Um, as the COVID-19 pandemic crossed across the world, many startups, corporations, governmental and academic institutions are searching for solution to end the pandemic. Their goal is to find quick solution to treat patients and support health caregivers to prevent contamination now and in the future and to build and adapt the current hospital setting. Some of them, some of those companies have already diverted their strategy toward the fast and practical aid. Others, and we will see that now, uh, already anticipated future need in the areas of vaccines, medical device, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, diagnostic, robotics, artificial intelligence, and digital health. So first, I want to give a um, warm thank you to our speakers. First, the, His Excellency, the Ambassador of the State of Israel to Switzerland and Liechtenstein, Jacob Keida. I want to thank uh, Cliff Ansel, who is the CEO of Respinova, Yakina Yanai, who is the CEO of Pluristem Therapeutics, and Chuck Karinian, the CEO of SonyV. During this panel, uh, the Israeli, it's called Israeli Response to the Pandemic. They will expose their views on the way to accelerate medical innovation through shared technological breakthroughs. Before starting, yes, you, you, I want to give a short snapshot about the Israeli life science hub today in the world. Uh, you have on the screen uh, a, a, an overview of the 180 companies that are uh, um, uh, fighting today and developing technologies against the, the, the virus. Um, I, I see, uh, Valentin, that you put the, the, the slide before, which is 70. I sent you another one with 180 company, which is my, much bigger, if you can find it. But anyway, I will describe it. Today, there is about 1,600 companies in life science in Israel, with a very, which is a number two global startup ecosystem. Uh, in the last uh, year, in 2018, there have been more than $2 billion uh, in, invested in uh, life science in Israel, and including $1.5 billion raised uh, capital. We, in the last five years, there have been 30 life science companies acquired above $50 million, and it represents uh, around 25% of all VC investment in Israel. Uh, in terms of sector, it's interesting to see as well that the pharma and biotech correspond to a third of the companies, the medical device 42%, and the digital health together with the new health tech uh, sector is about 25%, but it is obviously the one raising the most. What we have seen recently, and I want to mention it before I give the, the floor to our speakers, is that in the last years, we have seen um, bioconvergence between the, what we call bioconvergence, it's a, 
um, a merger of technology between the software engineering and the big high tech industry in Israel, which is uh, combined between data, computing, artificial intelligence, and material science. And today it's combining with other biotechnology like uh, development of biological and chemical drug, digita digitization of biological data, genetic therapy. And these bioconvergence in bringing completely new field of technology in the center between those two fields. And Israel is very well positioned to develop new technology stemming from this bioconvergence um, element. So uh, with this introduction, I will be, I'm honored to introduce our first speaker, uh, Her, His Excellency Jacob Kedar, Ambassador of the State of Israel in Switzerland and, and Liechtenstein. Um, uh, he already participated with us in a few conferences where we were describing the ecosystem and specific technology. And I would like him to give us an overview, not specifically now about the, the technology uh, developed in Israel, but more on the way in the last months, how the country handled the pandemic. That's very interesting because it was one of the first mover in the global scene and the, what's happening today and uh, how we can re relate to some of the, 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 the support in the industry. Jacob, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurent. And um, thank you, uh, Zach's Forum, uh, the organizers, for giving me the opportunity to speak and also for giving the opportunity to uh, many life sciences related uh, Israeli companies to um, introduce themselves and their technology in Switzerland and to other countries. I would like to start by saying a few words about the uh, situation of Corona in Israel. Um, we are in the second wave now, as many, many of uh, all of you should know. Um, at the first uh, phase, the numbers and um, the the uh, the numbers of people who in fact were infected, who were infected, the numbers of hospitalized people were very low, and we managed to contain uh, to some degree the pandemic with very harsh measures that the government has put in place, and then um, we opened we opened the the country, and um, now we are in the second wave. And uh, we have about between uh, 1,200 to 1,300 infected people every day. We have now um, about uh, 115 in severe health uh, condition, etc. It's not huge numbers, but, uh, but it's alarming. And the government is now uh, putting some of the measures that uh, it has lifted, they put them back. And we'll probably see a reduction of the numbers, but it will take time. Uh, so the situation is not easy, and it has a very, very severe effect on the economy. And we will see it uh, for, uh, for the long run. Um, also in Switzerland, we witnessed uh, at the beginning, uh, I mean, uh, very high numbers. Now the numbers are much lower. And uh, I also hope that we will not see a second wave. And this is a good opportunity to, uh, to wish Switzerland and Israel to, uh, to actually win over this pandemic as soon as we can. In Israel, as you well know, everybody um, kind of uh, took the, upon themselves the, uh, when I say everybody, it's government, it's uh, the public sector, it's the private sector, took upon them, themselves the, um, uh, the effort to try to find solutions uh, for the pandemic, um, including some uh, even uh, defense-related companies. Uh, for example, the uh, Israeli aircraft industry started to produce um, inhalating in intubated machines, and uh, Elbit started to produce uh, uh, communication communications for hospitals and the hospital staff. I mean. Everybody, it's like, uh, you know, uh, we, we, 
like it was drafted, everybody was drafted to, to fight the pandemic. And I re really recommend to read the article if you haven't read it. Uh, it's in German, but you can find the English translation of uh, Ulrich Schmidt from NZZ from the 22nd of uh, June. Let us not delude ourselves, we are at war. How Israel goes hunting for Corona. It's a wonderful article about showing how Israeli companies, uh, really, I mean, private and public companies, uh, started to, to deal with it. And uh, please, uh, the second uh, slide. Now, the Israeli uh, government also uh, decided to assist Israeli high-tech, uh, the high-tech industry, Israeli industry, Israeli hospitals and research institutes to help them uh, also um, uh, develop and produce solutions. The Innovation Authority with the Health Ministry, Ministry of Social Equality, Technology, uh, they, they decided to give money to technological ideas and early stage applications. Um, I think between 50 to 80 percent of the cost. And it's, um, it's a grant. It was a grant and uh, it, not only a loan. Uh, so this is how they work. We don't see it uh, in Switzerland, for example, uh, it's, uh, we don't have this kind of system. The Innovation Authority also through Horizon 2020, a science cooperation with other countries, uh, they uh, focused on uh, trying to uh, find solutions for a uh, corona pandemic and uh, they gave priority. And then the National Technological Center to fight Corona, which includes representatives from hospitals, academia, health services, provide, health service providers, industry, startup companies, etc., led by the Ministry of Defense, actually, Directorate of Defense Research, uh, Research and Development. Um, they turned, they took uh, military experts, military know-how, military technology uh, for civilian use to fight Corona including, may, uh, we have many examples. One of them is uh, robotics. Uh, so, I mean, everybody uh, tried to do his uh, share. And uh, please, the next slide, slide. Organizations that can get support from the government, technological companies, academic researchers, academic institute, industrial enterprises, private entrepreneurs. And, you know, the field of support is very uh, huge. Uh, from protection and prevention, diagnostics, remote services, treatment, solutions for healthy lifestyle and special needs population, etc. And we see, and uh, you mentioned it, Laurent, we see so many companies that are dealing with that, startups. We have now, you mentioned, 180, and uh, probably we'll see many more in all this range and in other fields as well. Please, the next slide, the last one. And just to conclude, I would like to say a word about Switzerland and Israel. Uh, we, have seen, we have seen in the, uh, during the last uh, month of Corona pandemic, scientific collaboration between the two countries. We have that going on all the time, but it has increased and specialized and focused on, uh, on fighting Corona, producing uh, new medicines, trying to find a uh, vaccine, and, and, other, and other issues between, uh, I, I mean, personally, I uh, managed to send uh, one sample because we have, uh, uh, we don't have flights. Now we start to have. So I managed to find a way to send uh, samples of protein to Israel from a Swiss university to a Hadassah Hospital Laboratory uh, for uh, trying to, uh, to produce uh, a medicine for severe uh, condition patients of corona. Then clinical and policy experience and data sharing between the ministries of health, between the teams, between hospitals like Sheba Hospital and Basel uh, University Hospital, for example. And then we have to thank uh, a few Swiss companies that uh, supplied uh, machines for respiration to, uh, to Israel uh, during this crisis. Maybe not as fast as we would have liked, but they did it. So uh, this is a good uh, opportunity to thank uh, the good, the good uh, cooperation between Switzerland and Israel. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Laurent.
Thank you, Jacob, for this uh, first overview. We'll come back to you uh, later on with additional questions. Um, now I will uh, give the floor to Cliff Ansel, who is the CEO of uh, Respinova. Uh, Respinova is an Israeli company developing a unique device uh, supporting uh, uh, pulmonary uh, condition. And he will tell you uh, the way uh, he has adapted the technology of the pulse hailer to specific uh, coronavirus patients. Cliff. Thank you, Laurent. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, the uh, people at SACS for uh, inviting me to come and uh, and present. Um, I think we're a little bit different than a lot of the treatments. Um, uh, when you look at Corona, most of the treatments are uh, medicinal or, or pharmaceutical. Um, we were, um, before Corona hit, trying to solve uh, a different problem, which is uh, chronic uh, lung disease or, or COPD. This is the disease. It's the number three of all uh, diseases, affects uh, many hundreds of millions of people and, and kills uh, many, many millions of people. And uh, we were developing, um, can I have the next slide, please, uh, Valentin? Uh, we were developing this device, uh, which works by using air pressure pulses uh, in a device that you breathe on to go into your lungs and reopen uh, the, the closed airways of these chronic lung disease patients. So in chronic lung disease, the airways that uh, bring the oxygen to your body uh, can get closed. And so we developed this system for using air pressure pulses to, to reopen those and also to help clear some of the mucus that uh, is in the, the lungs uh, we noticed that there are, there are some similarities between this and, and COVID. And so uh, we looked at different ways that we could apply our technology to, uh, to the battle on COVID. Uh, next slide, please. So really, we, we think of three ways that uh, our technology can help um, in the fight. Uh, first is, you know, before patients get COVID. So if you look at the nursing home situation, for example, where COVID really, really rips its way through nursing home patients, Part of this is because they have so many uh, already lung compromised patients that when they get COVID, um, they become critical very quickly. So one, uh, one application of our technology is to uh, pre-treat um, nursing home COPD patients, for example, uh, to strengthen their lungs before they might get, uh, get COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second way is obviously in treating COVID itself. Because of some of the similarities, uh, we thought that we could apply the technology to these serious but not yet critical, or even in some cases, critical ventilated patients. Uh, when the serious ones, our goal would be to use our technology to prevent them from deteriorating to, uh, to becoming critical. And in critical, uh, we actually have a way to incorporate our system with ventilators that uh, might allow people to be ventilated more safely. We read about a lot of the, the deaths from, you know, from overpressuring in, in, uh, in ventilation. And our technology, if you combine it with a ventilator, can enable uh, a type of ventilation that's, uh, that's more gentle, maybe lower pressure, but still has uh, similar efficacy. Uh, so these are, these are things that we are looking right now to set up uh, uh, clinical trials, both here and, uh, and abroad. Uh, last slide, please. Uh, the third way, and this is becoming more important as days go by, is that we now have literally, you know, 10 million patients that have survived COVID. And what we see is that many of these patients are being left with residual lung damage. So uh, the third place we see applicability is to treat and, and rehabilitate the lungs of these COVID patients using our technology. And we know this should work because we've already been able to improve the, the lung function of these chronic lung disease patients, which have many of the same uh, kind of things uh, happening to them. So these are really three ways that uh, we think our approach can, can benefit uh, COVID. It's, uh, it's a little bit different, uh, but it has applicability both before, during, and after uh, the pandemic. So. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to introduce Respinova, and I'll be happy to take uh, your questions, Laurent, um, during the panel. Thank you, Cliff, for this overview of what uh, Respinova is doing. 
So I'm uh, honored to, to introduce now Yaki Yanai, who is the CEO of Pluristem. Uh, Pluristem is a public Israeli company developing stem cell, stem cell technologies, and that recently had a very specific development against COVID-19. So it's uh, another example I wanted to bring to the panel. And Yaki, please introduce yourself and uh, Pluristem. You're on mute. You're on mute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent, and thank you everyone for uh, attending this conference. Uh, so my name is Yaki and I am the CEO and president of uh, Pluristem Therapeutics for the, uh, 14 years with the company. I also serve uh, in several positions in the Israeli ecosystem. Uh, I used to co-chair co the largest organization here in Israel for high tech and life science, and uh, a big believer uh, that uh, this industry is going to be the leading industry in Israel. Next slide, please. So in Pluristem, everything that we are doing is around cell therapy and regenerative medicine. The concept is actually quite simple, uh, but we invested heavily in order to make this concept uh, also affordable and something that we can use on a daily basis. We are collecting the cells from placenta after healthy full-term delivery. And we have developed in the last decade the means to extract the cells and to expand them in the bioreactors that uh, give the cells a very a natural environment to proliferate and expand. From a single placenta today, we can treat more than 20,000 patients. And as you can see, the product, it's actually cells in a vial. Each vial, as you can see in the middle, it contains about 100 million placenta cells. And the key advantage that we can use these cells without genetic match or blood match whatsoever. Uh, we have treated today, we are a company in a late stage development. We have treated hundreds of patients in US, in Europe, in Israel, uh, in Australia, across all ethnics, across all genders. And we are able to show the ability of the cells to be injectable without any match uh, at all. The treatment is uh, very simple. Uh, we are talking about intramuscular injection of the cells. Uh, and we were able to show uh, that the cells, once are injected into the human body patient, to the, human, to the patient body, they are starting to interact and communicate with the patient body. And they are secreting a lot of therapeutic proteins that is pushing the body towards the generation and helping the recovery. Our concept is regeneration, so it's not a chronic treatment. We treat the patients once or twice, and we are able to, to capture a very long-term effect. This is part of our approach and philosophy about introducing treatments that were able to serve the human beings, uh, also in the healthcare system, which is in a very, very uh, dangerous position according to our belief now, nowadays. The company is, uh, has its own um, in-house manufacturing capacity, late stage development. And we are fortunate enough that we have quite a good uh, support uh, globally. Uh, the company holds several contracts with the NIH, with the DOD. Uh, Horizon 2020 have funded several of our phase three studies. And also recently the European Investment Bank uh, has entered into a contract with us uh, to develop our pipeline, but also with a very uh, special interest uh, on the COVID. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go in deeply into the pipeline, but just for you to understand, Pluristem is a company with seven clinical assets, two of them in phase three. So we have a lot of data about our product, mechanism of action, and safety properties, which was very important. And based on the understanding from all the data that we generated today uh, on our product, we made a very uh, uh, we, we made the, the, the ability we, we had the ability to actually transform this cellular product also to treat complications of COVID-19 and we are targeting acute, acute respiratory distress syndrome ARDS associated with COVID-19. Next slide, please. So this is what we did. It was very be in the early beginning of the year that I got calls from some friends in China that said, Yaki, people are dying because of ARDS. That's the reason. And we know that in, a, in order to treat ARDS, you need to control the immune system reaction, the overreaction actually, and you need to reduce the cytokine storm. Once we understood that this is the issue, especially for people on late stage on mechanical ventilation, um, we presented 
the case. We knew that our cells can be actually effective in this case. We went to the Ministry of Health, the Israeli Ministry of Health. We showed them some of the preclinical data that we had and all of our mechanism of action and safety data from hundreds of patients. And they cleared us to move forward for a, a compassionate use programs in Israel. We started to treat patients in Israel in compassionate use. In parallel, we approached the FDA, showed them the same cases, and they actually cleared a single access, a single patient expanded access program. So to date, we, are, we treat quite a lot of patients on these two uh, uh, pathways, the expanded access and the compassionate treatment. Uh, in parallel, we received the FDA clearance and we already, already launched a 140 patients, double blind placebo control, a clinical study that we are doing in the US and we, we intend to expand to additional territories. We are treating the patients that are already on mechanical ventilation. I'm sure that most of you saw the data that was published in the US, but also in Europe and in Israel. Patients that are already intubated on mechanical ventilation, there is a very high rate of mortality rate. Numbers go from any number from 50% mortality rate up to 90% mortality rate. In the data that we released, and we released a long-term follow-up, the 28 days follow-up for, for patients on the compassionate use, we were able to show a very high survival rate and we really treated the most severe patients that exhausted all other options. More than 87% survival rate. The good news that these patients were very quickly went out of mechanical ventilation within a matter of a couple of days to 10 days. And the patients were discharged from the hospitals quickly. And that's something which is extremely important. We were able to show more than 60% discharge rate in 28 days compared to 3% of the global or US data that was able to present. So uh, it's, even though it's still on a, in a compassionate use, we do feel that we have a very strong signal. And that's the reason that we push this to, to this uh, double blind study. Europe is gonna come second and hopefully soon. And we are also the closest one of our key advantages that we invested heavily in manufacturing. This is a full scale many company that can manufacture a lot of product. And we uh, intend to approach to expanded access global program in order to, to treat the patients. The goal is take patients out of mechanical ventilation, take patients out of the ICU and discharge them. And I think that those can be very instrumental in controlling this pandemic and supporting the healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you, Yaki, for this overview. And uh, the third example we wanted to show during this panel, before going to, to question about the the innovation and the pandemic is Sony V and Chuck uh, is talking to us from Boston. So it's about uh, <laughs> five o'clock in the morning there. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Sony V has developed a very specific device that is initially aimed to fight pulmonary hypertension and they have diverted part of the technology to treat COVID-19 patients. He will tell you how now, Chuck. The floor is yours. Good morning, thank you. Thanks for having me and glad everybody is uh, on this call here. So um, so at Sonavi, as Laurent said, we have a system called the Tivis system, which is a therapeutic intravascular ultrasound system that had originally been developed to treat um, the nerves that run along the sides of blood vessels. And so we have been pretty far along in our development of the technology for pulmonary hypertension about to um, launch a pivotal study in the US, Europe, and Israel for pulmonary hypertension. But when the COVID-19 outbreak happened, um, I sat down with my team to see how we could maybe leverage our technology to fight uh, COVID-19. And what came up is that we have um, done some work previously um, in COPD that we thought we could leverage into this space. So the way our technology works is that small catheter you see being held in the glove has three ultrasound uh, piezo electrodes at the end of the catheter. We can thread that into a blood vessel or into the bronchus and the ultrasound energy is generated. It actually passes through um, either the blood vessel or the bronchus to the tissue outside where the nerves run and we're able to ablate those nerves to reduce either the sympathetic output for um, some indications of the parasympathetic output of the bronchus to affect disease. Next slide. 
So we've been able to leverage our, our technology as a platform technology for denervation. As I said, pulmonary hypertension is our number one application that's furthest along in development. We actually have a breakthrough device designation from the US FDA for that. Um, and as we said, we, we've been moving that into a pivotal trial in group one pulmonary hypertension, as well as we have a current trial in group two pulmonary hypertension. And it also had early data um, in treatment resistant hypertension for that as well. But in the chronic bronchitis um, area, we had done some earlier animal studies back in 2014 and 15 with very good results, but it had been put on the back burner as the focus was on pulmonary hypertension. And as Cliff already mentioned, you know, COPD and chronic bronchitis is a huge problem globally um, and can be you know, the, the cause of, of, of disease in over 65 million people in the world that have moderate to severe COPD. Um, in the US, it accounts for uh, the fourth most common uh, cause of death. Next slide. So one of the things that had become apparent early on, um, especially with the outbreak as it was happening in Italy, was that patients with chronic bronchitis seem to be at increased risk of serious infection and death from COVID-19. Um, what was found is that with respect to COVID-19, levels of angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2 receptors um, that's been reported to be the host receptor for the virus responsible for COVID-19 um, have been observed to be increased in patients with COPD. Um, and data that's uh, been being published and is about to be published, a lot of this data has been released early uh, because the disease has been evolving so quickly. Um, but what we can see is that COPD um, has been associated with severe coronavirus disease um, and that those patients may have a five to six fold increase of getting severe COVID infection um, compared to the general population. Um, and I think as we're seeing some of these second waves, we can see that you know, younger people fare better. Um, and in, one of the reasons that younger people fare better with the disease is they're less likely to have other diseases like COPD. Um, so, you know, we really felt that we could maybe impact this area uh, with our technology. Next slide. So what we're doing is we're targeting lung denervation. So in the main bronchi of the lungs, there are parasympathetic nerves that regulate much of the function of the lungs. Um, acetylcholine is released from those nerves that can regulate airway smooth muscle tone, mucus secretion, and local inflammation um, through the receptors that are found throughout the bronchial tree. Um, and we know that in patients with COPD, um, that parasympathetic activity is enhanced. And it's, it's potentially that the enhanced parasympathetic activity is also leading to the overexpression of the ACE2 receptors uh, that COVID-19 is binding to in the airways of those patients. So our goal is then to repurpose our treatment for pulmonary hypertension from an intravascular to an intrabronchial use and based on those earlier animal studies. And also we, we are now uh, doing new animal studies with some revised versions of the catheter um, in Israel. And we'll move that quickly into um, early human studies with a goal of trying to get a treatment out that can uh, better prepare patients to tolerate infection with the disease if they get exposed. Um, so that they can hopefully have the similar response to the general population. Thanks. Thank you, Chuck, for this overview of uh, Sony V technology. Um, now for the second part of the panel, I, I would like to ask every each panelist, and I will start with Yaki, who has as well a second hat as a former chairman and current uh, board member of a a IATI, which is the Israeli Association uh, for, and for Technology and Innovation. And I, I was mentioning uh, that we found today about 180 companies in Israel harnessing technology to combat COVID-19. We have C3 examples. We have as well companies working on vaccine and on drug fighting cytokine storms. We have uh, many companies working on remote monitoring and home care, social and mental aspects, protection, prevention. We have a few startups very active today in mass production from different technologies. And of course, we have diagnostic and decision support based on AI. So there are many. 
uh, initiative that are supported by the 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 different uh, part of the ecosystem. Um, to the, I would like uh, Yaki to, to answer the first question is how entrepreneur from healthcare startup uh, work efficiently and collaboratively with hospital and the research unit uh, in, while in the same time uh, we see a more difficulty to I would say not to raise capital, but at least to have close, uh, a closing of deals because of the difficulty to travel and to meet people. I know we had several transactions that were done in the recent months, but they started before the pandemic. I, I would like to, to, to see your views of, on one hand, very complex situation in terms of uh, people working together. On the other hand, so many companies developing new technologies. So how do you see that and what will be your um, recommendation? We have a lot of uh, investors and funds and a lot of startups, uh, CEOs looking at this conference. What will be your recommendation to handle this kind of uh, uh, contradictory uh, situations? Thank you for the question. So definitely interesting times. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's quite interesting times. Um, as you mentioned, the Israeli uh, life science innovation uh, uh, area is, is very live, vivid, active and growing. Just to give you like a, a glance of how this industry looks like today. Uh, uh, and as you said, until recently, I was the, the co-chairman of the, the IETI, the largest organization in Israel for high tech and life science. And I'm on the board and very active in the, in the area. More than 1,600 life science companies are active today, uh, and uh, it's counting, and it's continued to grow. In my approach and in my belief, the I mean, the COVID is definitely a, a difficult situation, but we need to adjust, and we need to adjust quickly. And we don't need uh, my, the way that I'm operating my company is uh, if this is the situation that's going to stay for a while. So uh, I'm, we're doing all the the, the changes and transforming ourselves very quickly in order to make sure that even if the, the situation will continue for the next 12, 18 months, we're good to go. We, and we're not gonna, and we're not gonna be depend on going back to normal because nobody knows how long it's gonna take. I'm seeing a development and I'm following, following the developments globally. And it will be, a very, I think it's gonna be a very interesting and a, a, a very interesting a, a period. The way uh, we are doing it, is uh, this is the time to exercise uh, all the contact relationship, personal relationship, and your network. This is something with, which works very strong in Israel. People know each other, people communicate with each other, people are helping each other. And when I'm saying people is CEO of companies, hospitals, physicians, and different networks that you're part of it. So this is the time to make sure that you are uh, able to identify the, the right people, approach them, and trying uh, to build these alliances together in order to, to help this country or, or to help globally. We are doing the same thing in the US and the same thing in Europe. And I think that what we are seeing now is a very interesting time for us as humanities, as, as, as human beings and the, the, for, for, for humanity that things are moving from the control of governments and the, the bureaucracy to the private sector. Many things are moving to the right direction before, uh, be, because of uh, initiative, innovation, working uh, together of, of companies. So uh, it's the time that we are seeing the rising of the business leaders and the, the, the private sector that saying, we understand how it looks like, we're gonna take an active part in order to control this pandemic and bring the things to normal. So it's about communication, interaction, alliances, and understanding that it's up to us. The way I operate Pluristel and my company, that everything is going to be basically up to us. I do not expect any government support in regulation or whatever. And we, we are the ones that are going to need to present the cases. And the companies, in my belief today, are much stronger than governments. And uh, we should make sure that uh, to, to, we, it's our mission to contribute to solve this problem. Nobody else is going to do it unless we're going to be there. And this is what you're seeing in the Israeli startups. People are rising up, understanding how they can adapt the solution, presenting that, and trying to build the alliances in order to make sure that we will be able to solve this crisis globally. 
Thank you, Yaki. Yesterday we saw uh, uh, the keynote speech of Eyal Zimlishman, who is heading in the largest hospital in Israel, the Shiba, uh, the initiative of ARC, which is uh, co combining many, many new technologies and supporting them by giving them a, a platform to develop. And it's one of the initiatives that, 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 that is currently running. Uh, I, I would like to hear uh, the, 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 the view of uh, Jack, Jacob, our ambassador in Switzerland, about the, the way, and I'm not here talking about public health and the pandemic situation in the country, because this is more towards the general public but more about the government, how they can foster uh, the, the work of every single startup. I know one of the main problem, and we are encountering it as well, is to <clears throat> be able to meet and to meet people that, uh, that are either medtech or pharma company from abroad, from the US, from China, from Europe, even though they have their own problem with the, the traveling. It, what, what what kind of uh, initiative do you do you seek and bid on? I know you cannot commit, but in order to help the company to keep the permanent relationship with uh, global partners, what what what? How do you see that? I know it's not an easy question. Well, first of all, um, I completely agree with uh, Mr. Yanai here, uh, saying that uh, the private sector. Uh, is taking a lot of the initiatives and uh, is rising up to the challenge and doing uh, a lot of things that, um, but it's not only the private uh, sector. I mean, it's uh, uh, hospitals together with the private sector. Sometimes the initiatives come, uh, come from the hospitals. Sometimes the initiatives uh, come from the scientific community. And um, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges that are met uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. What the government can do and has been doing, I showed uh, three uh, examples before uh, of the um, Innovation Authority and uh, of several government uh, offices, and, uh, and is including the Defense Ministry, including the Health Ministry, of course, uh, is to try and find ways to, uh, to help companies, to, uh, to give them especially funding. I really hope that it will be uh, done in a larger scale, uh, especially to startups, especially to young companies, to, to people, uh, researchers who have uh, the, the right ideas, uh, to, to allow them to make uh, collaborations with others. You know, now it's very difficult if I speak about Switzerland, uh, Israelis, uh, in principle, cannot travel to Switzerland, Israeli citizens, and uh, if they come, if Israelis or people from Israel come to Switzerland, they have to stay for ten days in quarantine because of the second wave of pandemic in in Israel, and um, it makes life very very difficult. But as we have been doing now, I mean, everybody is doing that. Zoom meetings uh, and other ways of uh, communication and uh, people, as you know, Mr. and I said, quite uh, quite right. Uh, people are using their um, their connections, and governments are using are using their connections. I mean, we have been uh, communicating with hospitals here, with companies here, uh, to try because we have a lot of requests, and this is. We are foreign ministry. We are not really uh, dealing with health issues on uh, in normal in normal days. But uh, during those last uh, five months or so, we have been doing a lot to connect uh, companies, to connect uh, scientific institutes, academic institutes, and um, government and private uh, sectors, hospitals, and uh, we we see some uh, nice things coming out of it of it as well. Thank you. Um, now I have a, a question more specifically to the, the, the part which is happening in hospitals. Uh, and even though Israel has not been overwhelmed so far and hopefully with a very severe patients in ICUs, 
I, I would like to ask uh, to ask Cliff and Chuck their views uh, on 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 the the way that uh, respiratory ICUs can benefit from some respiratory technology to solve the distress of uh, of patients in uh, in ICUs. Because overall, if the, the virus, we all know that if the virus is going down in, time, in, ter in terms of virulence, the number of persons infected is not so important. What is important is how many are converted towards severe patients that can lead to, to, to death. And I, I, you are both working on the, 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 the target, the pulmonary target. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to, and you know, you know for sure, about the whole ecosystem of monitoring uh, respiratory parameters and cardiology parameters. I would like you, your views of, of, of seeing how it's evolving today in the ICUs. Is it still a bottleneck? Are there enough uh, reaction capacity through the infrastructure or through the typical device, the new device that have been developed to monitor or to treat uh, a patient inside ICU? Uh, maybe Cliff, you can start, and we'll take a check. As well. I was going to offer Chuck <laughs> to start first, uh, since he got up at five in the morning to uh, <laughs> to join us, and then maybe I'll jump in after. Chuck, sure. you want to? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can speak uh, a little bit more from the current situation that we have here in the U.S. Um, again, you know, where we're seeing you know a new wave happening in the South and the West. Um, you know, I think that there's a few things, you know, one is I think that we are maybe a little bit better in terms of triaging patients and who should be put into an ICU, who should be put onto a ventilator and how to manage those patients. I think still that the primary emphasis is going to be on preventing people from getting to that point. So, you know, with a technology like mine or like Cliffs, if you can keep the people who are at risk for respiratory diseases a little bit healthier um, at the time that they might be exposed and infected, that we can reduce the numbers getting to the ICUs. Um, once they get to the ICUs, you know, it represents a number of challenges. One is that you know, the, the, we've got staffing issues, PPE issues, and other things of managing the patients. From even from a clinical development standpoint, you know, on the one hand, we're trying to move quickly in terms of getting into patients, but um, you know, um, the, the challenges you have, and I'm sure Yaki's seeing this in, in his studies, trying to get approvals at the hospitals to do a clinical trial in these very sick patients. We need to do these trials in sick patients in order to test the technologies, but hospitals are overwhelmed and trying to get the protocols approved. The regulators are overwhelmed getting them approved. And then you have to get into the patients quickly who have quickly become very sick and get them to consent to an experimental treatment. Um, it becomes a challenge. And so while we're trying to move quickly in these areas, it, it, the infrastructure gets overwhelmed quickly and then it's difficult to do. The last thing a hospital wants when they're overrun in the hospital and the ICUs with coronavirus patients is to be having representatives from companies coming in that can potentially introduce more infections um, into their hospital and into their ICUs to try and treat patients. So I think we, we get into a catch-22 with this virus that we need these new technologies but in order to test them, we've got to be able to move forward at the critical times. And you know, some of my friends who are working on therapeutics, you know, versus us, which is more preventative, you know, they're they're chasing the epidemic around the US and around Europe, trying to find the centers with the highest infection rates to then be able to go in and treat patients. And then by the time that they finally get all the approvals in place, the numbers of patients there are going down, so much like what's happened here in, in Massachusetts. And in New York, um, you don't have access to those patients. For a while in Israel, we weren't going to have enough patients in Israel to try to test. Now it's coming back again, and you have to try to get into those centers. So I think that this, you know, again, like I said, it's, it's a bit of a catch-22. We want to try to intervene quickly for these patients who are at the most critical point in the infection. And yet um, the current way of doing business makes it difficult to get into those uh, patients at the most critical time. Yeah, uh, Chuck, everything Chuck said, by the way, I, I would echo. I'm glad he went first because he summed it up really well. Uh, we're facing exactly the same thing, and maybe we faced it uh, uh, even more. So first of all, 
Uh, we have a we have a structural challenge in Israel in that if you if you think about ICU beds per hundred thousand people, we're among the lowest in the world. Uh, this is a kind of a well published uh, number. So uh, while our numbers are low, our our risk of it getting overwhelmed is uh, is perhaps higher than even you know we're about one third of Spain or Italy in terms of number of ICU beds per hundred thousand people. Uh, so that's a, a looming potential a problem, but but I agree totally with Chuck. Chasing chasing the uh, chasing the patients around has been a problem. Uh, we started trying to set up a trial in Israel, only to find that they were closing the wards by the time we even got near uh, uh, an ethics um, uh, committee. And uh, now that things are coming back, um, you know, unfortunately, there may be more more patients to uh, to work with, but there's also many, many trials going on here in Israel, and overall the numbers are low. So, you know, we're competing, you know, if, uh, if uh, Yaki is doing a, a study on a group of patients and there are five other, you know, um, treatments going on or 10, they're all competing for this little pool of patients. You know, sometimes those who are the best connected or, or best funded or, or maybe, you know, they, they have a solution that's more kind of um, traditional, um, you know, maybe get get some some priority. So it's been a challenge to to do that. Um, even in terms of, I think this is maybe for the bigger picture. Even in terms of executing a non-COVID related study in these times uh, has become a challenge. We started a study uh, just last week, and now the uh, the ward is closed because of an outbreak of Corona in that particular ward. Uh, so. Uh, it, it's challenging times, and I think maybe one point that, that Chuck hinted at, which I'll, I'll just maybe kind of amplify, which is the kind of solutions that, you know, if, if we're in the device business and not, not in the, let's say, injectable uh, solution business, um, the interventions that we're doing are perhaps a little bit more in terms of the routine of the patient. A patient's on a ventilator, you want to stick a new you know, something onto the ventilator or, or you know, checks case, maybe they want to operate on somebody. Um, doing that is perhaps a little bit more challenging than a protocol where it's a drug, we're going to inject the guy, he's, you know, he stays on his ventilator. If I want to connect my machine to a ventilator, it might be of great help, but it's it's certainly a lot more uh, intrusive to the, to the process. Uh, nevertheless, there are things that we can do, I think, to really help flatten the, the curve and, and really deal with these uh, with these pre-ventilated patients. And I think that's important uh, no matter how you slice it. If we can, you know, if we have patients, they, people are, are reluctant, to, uh, you know, as Yaki said, you know, why are people reluctant to put people on ventilators? Because their outcomes are, are generally not good uh, around the world. Maybe if they get injected with Yaki's uh, uh, cells, they'll be, you know, much better off. Uh, but prevention is uh, is a big is a big part of it. So if there's some way our devices can help in preventing these people from transitioning, uh, I think that's a big win. <clears throat> Thank you for your view, uh, Cliff. On, on that part, it's uh, indeed uh, quite uh, um, illustrating. So we 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 all analyze the current situation and we try to to predict an extraordinary incline of investment in healthcare in the coming years, mainly focused toward this pandemic and, and more even on the healthcare system readiness. And the period of, even though it's uncertainty, it's fascinating for us because we are part of the ecosystem and we can bring a lot to the, to the community and to the world. I, I would like to, to finish, we have a five minutes left, to have one minute each of you uh, a word about uh, where you believe Israel um, innovation will be uh, the most uh, useful in, a, I, I will use a Hebrew word, in a tikkun olam way, where, where they can bring their, their capacity to help solving the issues on a global basis. What, what is it that will, will be the key, the key element? And I know it's in one minute, but just give me your, what you have in, in your mind and to finish on a positive way. Jacob? Thank you. Well, 
I think that, uh, of course, uh, at the end, we will, uh, we will win the, the pandemic. And, um, uh, you know, I've been mentioning before the government assistance to, uh, to innovation in Israel. It has been going on for years, and now it's focused on Corona. But uh, I think that uh, we should really accelerate it. We should do two things. First of all, to, to give much more. To, uh, to companies, to uh, startups and, uh, and other companies, uh, to innovate more, to, uh, to work more, especially now on uh, COVID-19. And the second issue is uh, maybe to uh, improve our health system. I mean, you mentioned it uh, before, to improve our health system. But uh, the, what we have to do is... Well, if somebody in Israel will uh, will uh, produce a vaccine, it will be wonderful. I hope it will happen. Uh, it will happen, and I I believe it will be a collaboration with other countries. And uh, I hope it will happen soon. But those kind of things take time. Thank you, thank you, Chuck. One word. Yeah, I, mean, I think for me, you know. The, um, the ability for Israeli engineers to innovate quickly, um, to iterate quickly, um, and move things through that early development process, I think is, is critical. Um, it, you know, together with then the, the funding support that can come from the Israeli government, which is helpful, um, but just really leveraging some of the talents that, that exist in the, the country to move things through quickly. Um, you know, my team has done a great job with that, and we've been able to bring in other people quickly to keep moving that forward. And to me, that's really going to be the, the competitive advantage of being in Israel, where we have a great uh, pool of engineering talent that we can deploy quickly on these problems. Thank you, Chuck. So it's speed and, uh, and level of talent. Cliff, on your side, how do you see it? Uh, you know, when you talk about, uh, you mentioned the Hebrew word tikkun olam or contributing to the world, I, I think it's a natural outcome of Israel's market size that uh, we we never develop anything just for the Israeli market. Uh, we're always thinking about the the big market, and, and uh, everything we do in terms of innovation is really uh, outward focused. So uh, I think, uh, as as everybody has mentioned, you know, we have the ability, uh, and and we've proven that Israeli technologies can can really help. Uh, the world and uh, the more support we get from other places in the world uh, that recognize that if they invest in Israel, you know, we can't rely just on the government. I'm sure there's a lot of investors uh, tuning in to, uh, to this panel. Um, you know, I would say in invest in, in Israeli technology because uh, you've seen from history that, uh, that our solutions uh, do benefit the world and, uh, and that's what we need more of, I think. Thank you. And Yaki, with your hat of uh, IATI, what would you say on my question? I must say that even though it looks like a crisis, <clears throat> I am uh, as optimistic as ever, or even more optimistic than ever. I see the COVID as a huge opportunity uh, globally. One thing that we all of us know for sure, and it doesn't matter if you stay in Israel, in the US or in Europe or, or wherever, this is a, a very good opportunity to do a restart for our healthcare system, which are broken and they are not fit to meet the, the, to what's going to be here in the next uh, centuries and, and, and decades. I think that the system understands that now it's about prevention, and you've seen some of great technologies that was presented in this panel today. Uh, it's about prevention, it's about regeneration. So it's going to do a major shift for the entire system. COVID is a very good, strong uh, wake up call for all of us globally to try to solve it together. I'm very happy to see that, uh, and I'm seeing that on my daily basis. People are communicating much faster, easier, with no bureaucracy or, or borders. People are, can work together, pulling guys from China, US, Europe, Israel, and all of us are trying to solve this, uh, this uh, thing together. So for me, it's a wake up call. It's always difficult to wake up early in the morning, but we got a very strong one. And it's now time of all of us to, to, to work together, governments, private sector, and to, to, to make sure that we are overcoming the COVID, but more, more importantly, bringing a new fresh thought of how healthcare system should look like. Thank you, Yaki. So 
Thank you very much. So I will put to the last slide the, the, this picture of the 180 companies we identified in the field. Um, and we, I, I want to thank uh, Sachs for this fascinating uh, conference, which is dedicated to the, the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. I, I believe we brought uh, some ideas and some good illustration on the way to fight it. And I really want to thank all the panelists for the, your presence and your uh, views and wish you all the best and stay safe. Thanks again. Thank you.